You are. Okay, so chapter two on page, I think it's 959. Okay. <clears throat> and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said one to another, let us go, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Then, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before God, or before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this, was a just, and, and this man was just and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. 
and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of, of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as when they had finished the days, as they retoin, returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposed him to have been in the company. They went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking him the questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. <laughs> then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. That's it, chapter two. So, a lot of meat there. This is Luke's account of the, um, what you call it? The Christmas story, essentially, the birth of Christ. So, let's get into it. We do have quite a few slides today. So, I've got a question for you guys. When you guys hear about the Christmas story, what are some of the things that pop into your head? Just blurt them out. What's something that comes to your mind when you hear Christmas or the Christmas story? Jesus, manger, wise men. Birth of Christ. I agree on that one. All right. Okay. You guys think of images like this by chance that pop into your head? That's about just what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> so here we see, you know, we see this, uh, this really westernized kids coloring book almost. Actually, that's what it is right there. My first nativity book where we see Joseph and Mary, three wise men inside, you know, a stable with a wooden manger, right? Yeah. And we have other images like this. You see these in all the storefronts, right? Around this time, we see this little setup or maybe even one of these. I think this is one of the more common images that we see, right? But that's not too accurate, is it? We're going to talk about that. <laughs> so again, we're, we see these. And then what about this? Shelly, one of the first things that you said was a manger. Okay. No, my first thing I said was Jesus. Yeah, you did. Okay, okay, okay. But one of the items that you you were you were participating, not everyone else was participating. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to pick on you. You did say manger, okay? okay? And I predicted somebody would say manger. That's why it's in here. So, and when you think of the manger, this is kind of what's the image that comes into your head, right? I guess, yeah. Right? I mean, everything that I've seen growing up was always like this, you know, wooden structure that had hay in it and it was it just it almost looked even though it was not comfortable it looked kind of comfortable kind of a deal so before we get into the validity of some of those items we're going to do a quick little review of chapter one just as a reminder and then we're going to segue into chapter two so in our first chapter we saw john the baptist he was also a miracle baby born to some well-advanced individuals, but we know who his mother and father were. Not saying we don't know who Jesus's father is. We know who that is, but this was a miracle, but it, it wasn't um, a supernatural insemination, essentially. So in this instance, Zacharias and Elizabeth, well-advanced in their years, are able to have marital relations and produce this child. And we know that in Elizabeth's fifth, end of fifth, beginning of sixth month, 
The angel Gabriel also visits Mary and tells her that she will be with child. She also tells him what the child's name will be. And um, yeah, moving on, Mary goes and travels over there and she stays with Mary for three months, which is what uh, the text had shared with us. So we know when Mary left and went back to Nazareth that she was somewhere around three and a half to four months pregnant. We have assumed as a group that it's probable, or I should say plausible to say that Mary stuck around for the birth of John the Baptist, which is something kind of cool to think about. Um, something that, again, I've never thought about that in the past. It's just something as we're reading, we could see how those timelines would um, add up. We see the angel Gabriel delivering all this great news, and we see the people of the surrounding area when Zacharias finally opens up his mouth to say that the man's name is going to be Johannan or John Shortened, uh, that everyone's freaking out. What kind of child is this going to be? This is exciting. This is something new. So jumping into chapter two, the first three verses, uh, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. That word registered was, you'll see it in multiple translations as you go back. We see that there's a census that's taking place. We also see that the Romans utilized this to plan out how many soldiers that they would need in certain areas. Plus it was a good opportunity to pick the best and the strongest of the men to enlist into their army and also to tax. You know, I was reading one of these articles. I believe they said it was, yeah, 50,000 miles worth of roads were done during Rome's um, time here on, you know, in the world. And what's interesting is that those, many of those roads are still functioning today. And I don't see any potholes like we do over here. <laughs> In California, so uh, they did something better, okay? Um, we also learn in this section that there's two key players in Luke's account, and they are Augustus and Quirinius. So here we see these images. Again, these are just things that I've pulled off of um, Google and various Google images. And a couple things that we want to talk about this during this time during this leadership under Augustus, and this is from National Geographic, believe it, believe it or not, uh, it talks about, oh no, I went too many, go back. And it talks about how his, his real name was actually Gaius Octavius. He was really young. He fought in battle with Julius Caesar. And before Julius Caesar was murdered, he had etched um, Gaius Octavius into... Um, his lineage almost by adoption into his inheritance and uh, it, because of how impressed he was with this this battle that they went into and against i guess you could say the better judgment of his family they told him not to do this not to accept this inheritance but he chose to do it anyways at the age of 19 he was really really good for, from a political standpoint as well as um like a calculated uh, military type standpoint and thrived so much so that he became this, had this titer Caesar Augustus, uh, really just more referencing that he was of the gods, so to speak. And we know that during this time, he was trying to really unify what was going on in Rome. And this was also, to my understanding, the beginning of that, that term Pax Romana, which is known as the Roman peace. Yeah, actually, that's exactly when it's, it started. It started from the reign of Augustus to the reign of Marcus Aurelius. So it was from 27 BC to uh, 180 AD. And basically, the way that Rome worked is that this was the law. If you didn't do it, you're dead. And greater than 50% of the population were slaves to the state, right? So you were taxed heavily. They, 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 they operated in such a way that you would say it's, it's, um, it was peaceful because nobody acted out of turn, so to speak, right? Other things that we'll talk about real quick is the Quirinius, if I'm saying that right. Um, I call it the Quirinius contradiction here because as you guys are aware, 
in our world for the last several, I don't know, thousands of years, everyone's tried to dispute the text and dispute the Bible. And this is another one of those instances where it may come up in your lifetime where someone will say, oh, what about Quirinius? He wasn't even in charge during that time. So the text told us uh, in chapter two, it says the census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So the one of the Jewish historians, Josephus, I believe, was one of the ones to report that he actually served Syria during a time period after Christ had been born during this time frame. So people say, hey, this is a contradiction. The Bible's in error, so on and so forth. As archaeology um, continued to surface things all over in that, that part of the region, as well as some documents that came out of the Vatican that identified from some of the older church fathers, it turns out that he had a title attributed to him, which I, I didn't even bother writing it down because this was an extensive study that if you guys want to know about it, I can send you the links. But essentially, he held two titles. And what that title meant is that he served during this term, someone else came in, and then following that time, he took back over for that term. So both people are right, if that makes any sense. They're saying, oh, no, well, he served during this time period. You're absolutely right, but he also served during this time period. And these are the, the documents that support it. So it's just if someone comes up to you, because there's always people say there's so many contradictions inside the Bible, it's instances like that where people are thinking, well, maybe this guy served two terms and it took this document from, you know, the gosh, 1300s that was found uh, in the Vatican. So let's go into the next section, which is the, the next, you know, few verses here. Joseph went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. And the Bible lets us know that he was of the house and lineage of David, okay? If you recall from our study in John, John and actually it's Matthew. Matthew. Matthew shows the lineage of Jesus's roots as far as where he came down. And they knew that there would be a fulfillment of prophecy that the Christ would come from the line of David. This right here is just another one of those, those instances where the Bible's letting us know that this is where Joseph was from. And we also have a direct lineage from Mary to know that they're both of this Davidic line, right? So what was the purpose of them traveling to Bethlehem? Because that's the city that would be considered their home. That's, that, that's their home city where they were from. And what are they going there for? To be taxed. So that's what the purpose of the census is. We kind of find out a little bit more of the details in here. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is why Bethlehem? I got this really cool sheet. When we were doing our study of Revelation, I came across this article and I thought it was really cool. And I found as I'm learning in these studies how to, how to better use PowerPoint, I was able to import this PDF over into this, this sheet. But these are... I believe there's a total of 55, but this particular document says that there's 44 prophecies that Jesus Christ himself fulfilled, and this first page only shows the first 24. But number one, the Messiah would be born of a woman. Number two, that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Also in Isaiah, we see Messiah be born of a virgin, be of the line of Abraham, descendant of Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and would be heir to King David's throne. And the list goes on. In the first part of chapter two in Luke, we fulfilled a multitude of these items already. The, the exact verse that comes out of Micah that we learn is, and I have, I pulled the dates from these various scholars as they believe that between 700 and 735 BC is when Micah wrote the book of Micah or the prophet Micah, I should say. So 700 years before this instance that we're talking about right now, give or take plus or minus a few years, right? This is what was said. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. This particular prophecy that's coming out of Micah is not like 
it's just talking about a great ruler that's coming because of a unique character trait that no other ruler has had before. And that is mm-hmm. that whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Okay. That gives us a hint towards the Christ. And given that Christ entered his creation in the form of man through Mary, this is a fulfillment of that scripture. As I was reading uh, more about the study in Micah, instead of going greatly into the book itself, there was this really good summary about Micah. And I figured I'd read it to you guys so you're aware. It says, uh, the prophet condemns the rulers, priests, and prophets of Israel who exploit and mislead the people. This was 700 years before. It is because of their deeds that Jerusalem will be destroyed. The prophet Micah proclaims the deliverance of the people who will go from Jerusalem to Babylon and concludes with an exhortation for Jerusalem to destroy the nations who have gathered against her. The ideal ruler would come from Bethlehem to defend the nation And the prophet proclaims the triumph of the remnant of Jacob and foresees a day when Yahweh will purge the nation of idolatry and reliance on military might. The prophet sets forth a powerful and concise summary of Yahweh's requirement for justice and loyalty and announces judgment upon those who have followed the ways of Omri and Ahab. The book closes with a prophetic liturgy comprising elements of lament. Israel confesses its sin and is assured of deliverance through Yahweh's mighty acts. Um, Foreshadowing in Micah 5.2, it says it's a messianic prophecy quoted when the Magi, searching for the king born in Bethlehem, kings of the east were told that from the tiny village of Bethlehem would come forth a prince of peace, the light of the world, Micah's message of sin, repentance, and restoration finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ, who is the propitiation for our sins. <laughs> that's, that's Mike's word there. Um, the last part that they note in here that I really like, it says, uh, for the practical application, God gives warnings, so we will not have to suffer his wrath. Judgment is certain if God's warnings are not heeded and his provision for sin in the sacrifice of his son is rejected. For the believer in Christ, God will discipline us, not from hate, but because he loves us. He knows that sin destroys, and he wants us to be whole. This wholeness, which is the promise of restoration, awaits those who remain obedient to him. So one of the things that I I wanted to draw as a note here that was interesting is we see all this praise and all of these reports about how great Caesar Augustus was and this accolades that he earned at such a young age. And, you know, it was a really wise strategy to call into the census to just strengthen Rome. But realistically here, God ordained this to happen 700 years prior to this, years before, hundreds of years before Caesar Augustus was even born, because he had told the prophets it was going to happen in advance. The prophets recorded what was going to happen. And in order for, (laughs) this is where this kind of, this is when we talk about providence. This is God's will working out. Mary and Joseph needed to be in Bethlehem in order for this prophecy to be fulfilled. God set it in motion beforehand, hundreds of years beforehand, and utilized the secular leadership of that day to fulfill his will. Ergo, God never being able to be a liar. And I thought it's really cool because they say, oh my gosh, this guy Caesar Augustus was so great. It's like, yeah, okay. How about the fact that God 700 years ago put this plan in motion to get this poor little couple over to Bethlehem to fulfill the scripture, you know? So, one of, the, one of the things that jumps out during the reading is that Mary was stuck outside because there was no room for him in the inn, speaking of uh, Joseph and Mary in this instance. And so as I was reading and doing some research, I came across this thing from Skip Heitzig. And again, I have these on the bottom hand here. If you guys want to look these things up, you could always just grab the information from there or I can send them to you after. So he explains that a better translation would be this term caravansaries, right? So the inns in those days were anything but a holiday, and he's referring to a holiday inn, right? (laughs) And he says, 
When it says the inn, there was no room in the inn, a better translation would be caravansary or a place where caravans would stop, camels and donkeys and horses, caravans of people with their animals and loads of their goods. They would have these caravan inns, caravansaries, all the way throughout all the part of the world. There are ruins of many of them in those parts of the world. Uh, to this day, you can see them. This kind of an inn was an open cart courtyard to the sky with rooms all around it, except at the opening. In those rooms, the floor was raised up a foot or two. In that little floor called the Luan, you could rent an empty room and you could spend the night there. Your animals were in the court courtyard. So it's not a great place. Didn't smell that great. It's all the, anim it's all the animals in the center court uh, courtyard and your side of camped out in a little modest room around the edge. That's an inn. There was no room in the caravansary, which would force Joseph and Mary either to be out in the field in some cave or at the center part of that caravan. Um, it's, what, did I cover all that? Yeah, I did. So there's no room in the inn. They were forced out where the animals were kept in the courtyard. I know that doesn't fit with your picture that you have of the nativity set in your house. <laughs> Horror. What you have seen in all the cards and all the Christmas movies, but those are the facts. Either they were out in a field somewhere or in a cave where they were in that caravansary, but no room in the inn, but only in that big expansive courtyard with the animals. So we talk about these caravansaries. We talk about how we have archaeological records of the items that were used in these types of outward inns. And so they've come across the mangers that they utilized. And this is what they look like. Wood was really sparse during this time, but stone was abundant, especially limestone. And they would hewn out of rock, out of stone. They would cut into these pockets for water and hay. They would put the feet inside these things. So this, in fact, is a manger of that time period. It's literally a rock. And I want you guys, I, I wrote something here that um, I just wanted to share, and again, it was, I had heard it from times past, but I, I didn't understand the perspective on it because I didn't truly get this whole manger thing, but think about how Jesus entered this world, right? He's wrapped in swaddling cloths, laying in a hewn stone manger. How did he exit this world? He was wrapped tightly with cloths and placed into a grave that was hewn out of stone as well with a rock rolled in, in front of it. It's almost a foreshadowing of how things will end up for him. Not as a surprise, but foreshadowing, I would say, for us. So, verses 8 through 20. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. So this unnamed angel makes this comment, euagilizio, right? <laughs> That's the Greek for that. I'm going to pull it up for you. So you know how I use this, this application called ESORD. And you can see in the screenshot, this word G2097, that's that word EU, EU Agilizo. So if you look at the very top, it says, and the angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. What is the definition for that word? I bring you the gospel. He's bringing them the gospel and not coincidentally, but Intentionally, this is the word that Paul uses all over for preaching the gospel. Go out into the world and preach the gospel. It's the same word that the angels gave to the shepherds out in the city. And I thought that that was really cool. So when I did a word search on this word, uangelizido, there was 55 matches that came up. And I highlighted this one because I really like it. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus answered and said unto them, go on your way and tell John what things you have seen, how, or what you think you have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the, to the poor, the gospel is preached. 
and he's referring to the good news, which is what we always utilize when someone, when I ask you guys, hey, what's the good news? Could you define the good news to me out of a single verse? John 316. <laughs> <laughs> That's our hint, right? Other things to me that are really cool about this is we see that this angel spreading the good news, but who, uh, what does it say? For unto the born city of Zion, the land of major and seven of the heroes. Okay, so who is getting this heavenly insight into God entering his creation? Who are the people that get to hear? Oh, uh, Simeon and Anna. So the answer I'm looking for, because that technically speaking is correct, is the shepherds, right? You would think that if you are going to be of some royalty or of some really high rank or something along those lines, the people who are going to hear this is going to be the king, the king's guard, the Caesar, the so on and so forth. But God allows for the shepherds who were technically speaking excluded out of everything because they were always deemed as ceremonially unclean because they were handling the sheep and they never got to participate in the Sabbath. Even though they provided those sheep to be as the sacrifice for the sins of the nation, they were considered outcasts. If we recall and go all the way back to uh, Genesis when they asked, when the Pharaoh asked Joseph about his family, he says, oh, they're shepherds. And they, he says, okay, we'll give them the land of Goshen because shepherds are an abomination to us and our people. They were really frowned upon and really looked down upon, right? And we often see God or Christ, I should say, referring to himself as the good shepherd, right? Again, echoing in that humble status, that that he took for us, right? So the other thing I want to what I note here is this last part that I highlighted. And suddenly there was an angel, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. I, I truly believe that this is one of those instances where God allows certain people on earth to get an, an idea through like a multitude of dimensions to see what heaven's like. Because we see in, in just an instant, this one angel who they're freaked out about, they have no idea how to respond. And he tells them, don't be afraid. Same way that Mary responded to Gabriel, don't be afraid right? Or how about when Zechariah, Zechariah is freaking out. Don't be afraid, right? There's something powerful about these beings that God has created that's frightening. And in this very brief moment in time, to the lowest people of the land, God reveals to them what's going on. They get to see what's happening. And it, I, I can't even, um, it must have blown their mind. The same thing, trying to imagine it now, you would hear these things. You would do the exact same thing that they did. What do they do? The, the Bible, the King James puts it so eloquently. They made haste and ran to, you know what I mean? You know, these guys were sprinting to go find where Mary was to see this King that had been born, the Christ who had been born. And I also thought I was, I was thinking about it. I bet you the shepherds knew exactly where they were. And what I mean by that is the fact that the angels chose the terminology to say that he's laying in a manger, the fact that they were uh, in for, they were so involved with animals as, as far as taking care of the sheep and whatnot, they would have known where that section was over like going into the palace guard or something along those lines would have been, you know, like a really elevated state. Um, and that's what I got for that. What else do I have here? As I was reading this, remember in chapter one, where Luke says that he understood things from the beginning perfectly, and he felt like it was good for him to provide an account. 
because he had an, a perfect account from those. And there's a lot of scholars that say it's as if, actually there's only a couple, but it's as if he was able to speak with Mary directly. As I was reading this section of verses, I couldn't help but imagine that this is literally Luke sitting down with Mary and Mary's telling him almost in a shooting script, the things that happened as she was the mother and was experiencing these things. She's inside the inn. They had, this is all that they could do is put him inside the stone manger. And then out of nowhere, these shepherds come running to her saying that we saw an angel. They came to us and said such and such. And we see Mary keeping these things in her heart. How would Luke know that? It's to me, it's, it's just like, it's, it's so awesome to think that he had this dialogue with her and she had an opportunity to give an account of these events and it was all guided by the Holy Spirit. So that was just something that I wanted to add on that. Um, uh oh, I'm missing this page on mine. Okay. So, and when eight days were completed for the circumcision, the child of the child, his name was called Jesus. And actually, I have something good on this. Okay. No. One second, guys. Sorry. I don't know why this isn't. There it is. Okay. So, do you guys remember why he was called Jesus? We can actually look to John for this because his name meant something. It was Jehoshua, where we would get the name Joshua from, right? Or save the people. In, yes, in Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. This is what was told to Joseph from this heavenly vision that he had. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So that's where he got his name, number one. Number two, we're going to talk about, what is going on? <laughs> we're going to talk about uh, the fulfillment of the law that took place here, because it's going to give us a little bit of insight into why they did what they did. Here it is. So this is out of the book of Leviticus. And the Lord spoke to Moses. And this is what he said. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, if a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As in the days of her customary impurity, she, bell, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of the foreskin shall be circumcised, or the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall then continue in her blood, in the blood of her purification, 33 days. She shall not touch any hallowed thing, nor become in the sanctuary nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification are fulfilled. And then it goes on to talk about what happens if there's a female child. But here at the bottom, this was the law. This is the law for who here is born a male or a female. And if she is not able, oh, I'm sorry. The, what you were supposed to provide was a lamb of the first year as a priest, for the, as a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering, right? But if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One is a burnt offering and the other is a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her and she will be clean, right? So in this last verse here, we see child shall be called Jesus. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So one last item that I want to cover on these verses before we go to the next portion is we know now with modern medical sciences on why God chose the eighth day, but they at that time didn't know. They were just obeying what God had instructed. And that's because the vitamin K levels are so high at this time. So the clotting factors that are there allow and promote for healing. And uh, we wouldn't see infection and those things of that sort, which we know about now because we have the technology to study it, but they just did it back then um, because that's what God had instructed. Moving on from the eight days. 
they make it to the temple, right? So we just learned how long it took for Mary until she was clean. It was what, 40 days? 40 days. She had seven days on the eighth day. She was good to go. And then 33 more days. So we know it's 40 days from when they were at the inn. They're now going to the temple. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And he was a just and devout. Oh, and he and this man was just and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. He took him up in his arms. I just see him grabbing this little baby and sticking him up almost like a scene out of the Lion King. You know what I mean? Just holding him up in the air and bless God saying, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of who? All people. All peoples. Oh, you mean for the Gentiles too? Well, he could mean just his people, right? Because he's saying all people, it could be all the Jews. And a light to bring revelation to who? The Gentiles. To the Gentiles. So this guy, Simeon, knew the program. The Holy Spirit had revealed it to him beforehand. Because remember, the rest of the Jews, or I should say the, the, uh, the majority of the Jews, I, I, I'll say that much, had this belief about where Gentiles belonged. And they were, they were here because they kept the hells and the, the fire and hell keep, kept burning hot, right? He has a clear understanding that this baby had come for the face of all peoples and was going to bring a revelation to the Gentiles. So he's going to reveal to the Gentiles and, a, and then a glory for the people in Israel. I thought that that was really cool. And the, ver the verse that we see right after that, and Joseph and his mother marveled at that, tho that those things which were spoken of him. And I'm like, Joseph and Mary, they're seeing angels. They got, they've got this instance where the, you know, these individuals are coming to them. The shepherds are coming to them. They're having these experiences. Why would they marvel at this? And I, I think it's because of the Gentiles part. You know what I mean? I, I can't prove that. I just suspect. And again, this is an instance where I think that we're talking about Luke dialoguing with Mary directly because it says, then Simeon blessed them and said to, his, said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many people and for a sign which shall be spoken against. And yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Um, this is obviously speaking of Christ's death. And I think that he was aware of that as well, uh, as far as Simeon's concerned. And I think this is another one of those items that would foreshadow to Mary what was going to happen to Jesus. <clears throat> the very next portion, or the next section, I should say, it's actually in the same sentence, is while they're in the temple, another individual comes up, and her name is Anna. And we know that she's old, you know, not in saying that in a, in a negative way, but we see that she was of great age. The Bible's saying that she had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. Okay. But she was now a widow for 84 years and did not depart the temple. So, I mean, if we just added those two, we know that she's in her nineties. That's not including uh, how much time she lived prior to being with her husband, right? And so um, what did she do? She didn't depart from the temple, serve God with fastings and prayers night and day. And in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption, okay? When we use that Strong's Dictionary and we look up this, this word in its original text, because we've brought up the word redemption multiple times before, Redemption means ransoming. She's saying something different than Simeon said. And I think that's why it's included here, because what, what did Christ do for us? His death paid the price for our sins. He was 
the sacrificial lamb that needed to take place as, as a permanent book cover over our sins, right? So this word ransoming, when Christ was on the cross and he, and the word totalistai comes out, which means it is finished. And we see that this ransom, which was paid in full, remember paid in full. We see this woman, Anna saying, she served God with fasting spirit nine day and coming in that instance, gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Speaking of Christ as the savior via paying a debt that we couldn't pay. He paid our ransom. So once these items inside the temple take place, we don't know exactly how this timeline broke down. I'm going to share with you guys what my suspicions are for this after we go over a couple other items. But verses 39 through 40, it says, so when they had performed all these things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace was upon him. A couple things I want to talk about. His humble beginnings, right? Christ, if we recall in the book of John, the entrance says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then there's a prologue to it, and in the very end of that says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, okay? Christ was there at the creation. He was an active participant in it. So Jesus is entering his creation absent from his role as creator. That makes any sense, right? The path in which he chose to come into his creation, he could have chose any path, any path in the world. He wrote this right? He's writing the future that we're experiencing now in the present. It's already written, okay? He's, he's conceived in Nazareth, right? Do you guys remember what one of the disciples said? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was a, it was a really humbling place to, to live in. He's born in a cave or outside in a stable somewhere. We don't see any instances of having a midwife present, so that means that Mary and Joseph did this solo. He's laid in a feeding trough, a feeding trough as, as his uh, crib. And he's not announced to the palace guard. He's announced to shepherds. When the fulfillment of the law was taking place, was a lamb sacrificed to him? Or was a lamb sacrificed for him? No. We see that it was a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. There, when you look at the, the different scriptures inside Leviticus, it almost seems as that that is the route that you would go if you couldn't afford anything else. So we see poverty. So why? Why would the creator of all this choose this route to be his entrance into his creation? And he gives us an answer why. This is what the scripture says. It's in Philippians. We read Philippians together. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Second Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, speaking of you and I, he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. We're starting to get an understanding of those scriptures. We're seeing it right here in, in these verses. And then again, in Matthew 20, 28, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, right? That was a fulfillment essentially of what that Anna the prophetess had said. So great. now that we've covered the humility, essentially him being so humble and the way that he entered, we now are flash forwarded into essentially he's 11 years old, right? He was 40 days old in the temple. Some time has transpired. We now see that um, 
when he was 12 years old, he went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. So they, they participated in the feast of the Passover, right? Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey. Man. <laughs> so basically mom and dad think that Jesus is there and they're gone for about a day. And when they get to that day's journey, they're looking throughout the family asking where Jesus is and they lost him. Uh, I can imagine, I can, I, I mean, I don't know how it went because this is a divine experience, but I could tell you about when Michelle and I went to uh, Great America and we were walking towards the exit gate and there was the comment that was saying, hey, uh, um, where's Levi and Michelle? And, and Michelle's looking at me because he was supposed to be with me. I was like, <gasps> I don't know. And there was that moment where you have like that major freak out moment. But within seconds, there was a guy who was carrying Levi and brought him to us. And Levi was like, you left me, you know, and oh my gosh, it's like the worst <laughs> feeling in the world. They were a day's journey away and didn't know where he was. I, I imagine that there was some animosity as, as humans, you know, especially in the way <laughs> that Mary says, your father and I have sought you anxiously. I mean, you can almost see the emotion in that, um, but it took three days. For, for them to find him. They were gone a day. It took a day to get back to where they were. And so they must have sought him entire day after the third day they found him. But it's, it's very interesting to note right here, right? So if you recall when Mary was pregnant and she wasn't, but maybe a week pregnant or two weeks, let's call it that. She makes a journey over to see Elizabeth and Elizabeth says that the baby inside her womb leaped for joy because she knew that Mary was carrying the Savior. The baby had perceived what was going on. Jo Mary, or Mary Joseph. Jesus is 11 years old, okay? 11 years old. I, I know 11 years old. Lennon's 13, going on 21, but I can remember 11 years old. <laughs> 11 years old, Jesus is telling his parents, right? Mary says, look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. But Jesus responds and says, why did you seek me? Do or did you not know that I must be about my father's business? At 11 years old, he clearly understood what his purpose was here on this earth. And he knew who his father was. Yes, yeah. Joseph was here as his earthly father, but his heavenly father. And essentially, Joseph was a stepdad. He, he didn't... He, he was there to help provide for the physical needs, but God was providing everything else as well as the inception because it was a supernatural birth. But Jesus was aware at age 11. And the fact that John the Baptist, while in the womb, had some experience while he was still just inside the womb tells us a lot about these individuals and uh, really Jesus's ability, even at a young age. Elliot, wasn't he 12? Yes, he was 12 years. It, no, that's what I'm saying. The, 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 the slide said 11 years later. Oh. So I remember Mary yeah, was, the book says that 12 years, 12 years of age. He was 12 years. Okay. Absolutely. I, I, and what I meant by that 11 years later is that he was still in Nazareth, right? Because we know that the Magi came and visited them in Jerusalem, so on and so forth, while they were still um, around the temple time. Okay. So I was just insinuating that this is 11 years later in between this verse and the last verse, right? So mm -hmm. right here in verse 39, it says, so they had performed these things according to the law of the Lord. They returned to Galilee to their own city, city Nazareth. Okay, and then it cuts to, here's the scene. He's 12 years old now. I was saying 11 years later, so on and so forth. But yes, you're absolutely right. He was 12 years old when this was happening. Um, this is one of the things that I, I wanted to show you guys. It's, uh, it's a timeline that someone has done that has the events that are in the Bible chronologically written. So one of the things that you'll note or that you may question is where's the wise men? That was one yeah. of the things that we talked about 
And in all of these nativity sets, we see the wise men. But yet in Luke's um, documentation of this event, he doesn't include them. And there are some other things that transpired that aren't included there as well. And it's the way that the Holy Spirit had dictated these guys to write these things. Because if you look at the text closely, it's not that he's saying that they didn't happen. It's that he didn't include them. So we see this line of events on the left, and we see these things as they're transpiring in the book of Luke. And then we'll notice that in Matthew, there's a couple other events that are all happening in perfect synergism so that this timeline is accurate and yet it's including these verses from the different portions of the bible right so we see in jerusalem that zechariah is told that his wife's going to be child now in nazareth an angel had announced to mary that she would give birth to a child mary visits her cousin in judea in nazareth the angel gabriel told joseph and joseph to take his take mary as his wife john the baptist is born in judea Unto us a child is born, a son is given, as Isaiah 9 says. And so in Bethlehem of Judea, in Luke 2, verses 1 through 21, which we just read, Jesus is born. Forty days after the, purif it was a, the purification time, Jesus is dedicated at the temple in Jerusalem. After that happens, you may recall our study last year of Christmas, that in Matthew chapter 2, the Magi come. But who do the Magi come to? The Magi come to Herod in Jerusalem asking where the king of the Jews was born. And what were the three items that the Magi brought? They were gifts of gold, a frankincense, and myrrh. And those three things are important because one was his, the fact that the gold was that he was a king. The frankincense represents that he was a priest. And the myrrh was something that you put on uh, an individual for their burial. So it represented the three tenses of him and, and really the life that he would, he would leave as a king and priest and, and subsequently die for the nation. So one of the things that we talked about when we did the study in Matthew is that Matthew records that the Magi came when the boy was in a home. That's right. He wasn't in a manger. So it's believed that he could have been between one year old and two years old. And Matthew's account is not contradictory to Luke's. Luke just went from here to where he was 11 years old. And I thought, I, I thought it was pretty cool because they talk about how poor Mary and Joseph were, right? And how much poverty was involved and how it's unique in that Christ essentially took on the role of like the absolute worst position you could take. So you can't say, you know, well, he had it easier than I had. It's literally like he can associate with anyone, no matter what their background is, as far as their birth, considering what he's gone through. And it was interesting to see, well, one of the pastors that I was listening to said that, you know, it was interesting to note that it's probable that when the Magi had brought these gifts that it was from those gifts that Joseph and Mary utilized those as funds to flee King Herod and go into Egypt. And remember, he spent, he was in Egypt. God, it's even on this list in Matthew 2, verse 12, God warned the Magi not to return to Herod to tell him where the king of the Jews was born. And an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him to take Jesus and Mary and flee to Egypt. So they leave Bethlehem, they go to Egypt, Herod issues this decree to kill all the kids that are two years and, and, and younger. Interestingly enough, he, Herod had determined and deciphered based upon when this star appeared, when the Magi had, had, uh, had discussed it, that he basically had to wipe out everyone who was of two years age and younger to kill this born king, which gives us some insight also into the, how old Jesus was during this time, Right. So while they're in Egypt, after Herod's death, an angel appeared in a dream to Joseph and told him to take Jesus and Mary back into the land of Israel, but they're warned not to go through Judea. So he takes Jesus and Mary to Nazareth of Galilee. So we see these things happening inside the book of Matthew, and they're not contradicting Luke's account. Luke says that after these things, they end up in Nazareth, which is exactly where they ended up in, according to Matthew's account. 
He just doesn't include this, this experience with the Magi. And it, I think it's, it's important that that's there. I don't understand the importance of it, but there are in there are individuals like a guy by the name of Lee Strobel, who was a diehard atheist who basically felt like he was going to be able to disprove God by what he would have perceived as errors in the gospel. And so his, his goal was to do this. And he was, I, I think he was, um, oh my goodness. I want to say he were, he was an investigative reporter, but he was also, um, what's the, not an interrogator. I, yeah, I guess it would be considered an interrogator. Essentially he worked in, in a capacity where he would analyze victims stories and would recognize similarities and in, in different scenarios and would feed out the facts from the fiction. And he had this whole technique that he used to do it. And he had this really high success rate. And that was the rate that he wanted to apply to the Bible. And what he discovered was the fact that there were different items that were recorded in each one of these gospels that coincide with one another. It speaks to uh, the truth of the scenario because it's not a corroborated uh, event to discuss the same facts. It's as if this guy's over here and he's getting all these eyewitness accounts and he's taking them and he's writing them down. And then another individual is having an experience and writing it down from them. And the two are meshing together, even though there's details that aren't, that it's not that they aren't the same. It's that their account, they're different accounts of the events that happened that mattered to them. And uh, because of this experience that he had, uh, he ended up giving his life over to Christ and writing all these books about how he, he wanted to disprove God. And there's actually a movie out that's based on his life story. It's called the case for Christ. And it's how he aggressively sought out to prove the Bible wrong. And it totally changed his life. And uh, he's basically out spreading the gospel. <laughs> oh, Elliot, at the end, he came out with this timeline as we are seeing in front of us. This is from Lee Strobel? No, but I mean, the truth, right? Right. No, yeah, I was going to say that that's not what I got it off of, but. And I, that's pretty much all I have. And that's the end of, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here for next week. We're going to reread chapter two and read, I'm going to try and get through chapters two and three next week. And let's go ahead and, and three and stop.